So it was a very uh, eventful week for us. As you may or may not know, we were blessed with a baby boy on Monday. So today is Sunday. So it's been almost a week. Uh, early Monday morning, 2.46 a.m., we were blessed with a baby boy, a big one, the biggest one yet. I think it was eight pounds and nine ounces, nice and hefty, but really tall. Not so chunky, but big, solid, thank God. Uh, baby's doing well. Mom is doing well. Uh, please got tomorrow on Monday, we're going to have the bris at the torch center at 9 a.m. Of course, the baby's born on Monday, and the bris is eight days later. And, of course, you count day one. So Monday counts as day one, and therefore the success of the upcoming Monday is eight days later, and that is the bris. And what I thought to do today is to share with y'all what I said on Friday night at the Shalom Zachar. Now, what is a shalom zachar? So the word shalom or shalom means peace or welcome. And zachar means a male, a boy. And there is an ancient tradition that on Friday night, the Friday night after a baby boy is born, you get together, the whole neighborhood comes over, and you have some alcohol and some beer and tequila. And of course, as you may know, I don't drink so I had to call one of my friends and say, well, what should I get? What are the people like? You got to get some bourbon. You got to get some this and some that. I went to the store. You got it all. So you have that. And then you have the cakes and the cookies and the nuts and all the junk food and chickpeas. Everything. You have to have chickpeas. That's the tradition. And people drop off stuff. So the whole Friday, there's just a, a cascade of people dropping off stuff to celebrate. And then Friday night, after the meal, people come over. You know, we had a very sizable crowd and uh, it kind of started at like 8.45 and I think the last person left at like 12.30. So almost four hours. And it's a wonderful thing where you celebrate the new baby and you sing together. Everyone who watched sin, I give them a lachaim, I give them a shot. I, I filled up a shot glass with a little bit of scotch and I kept on taking a tiny little shot. It's like the whole night I had like one shot just to make sure that I'm drinking with everyone. And of course, you, you share divrei Torah, words of Torah, and everyone who comes in shares their, you know, their, their mazel tov blessings for the new baby. And I have a tradition with all my boys that when there's a Shalom Zachar, I speak. So I want to share with you what I said on Friday night. So first of all, you know, now we have daylight savings time. And because there's daylight savings time, Shabbos starts later. So in our community, as is true in many communities, there is an early minion, meaning you, people take in Shabbos earlier. And therefore, you have like, um, you know, the, 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 the prayers that happen on Friday night happen over like an extended period. So the first prayers... And the first group, the first cohort of people praying, they prayed at 6 o'clock and Shabbos started for them a little earlier. And the latest one was about an hour and change later. So over the course of the Shalom Zachar, over the course of the night, there were different cohorts. So I ended up saying this speech that I'm going to share with you today. I said it twice to accommodate the different groups. And when I said it, I said it in a much shorter version and because it was a, kind of a local crowd, I peppered it with some Hebrew and Yiddish words. But today we're going to do it exclusively in English. So here's what I said on Friday night, this past Friday night, by the Shalom Zachar of my brand new baby boy. What's the reason for this ubiquitous custom? Why do we have this custom to have a Shalom Zachar, to get together together? specifically on the Friday night after the birth of a baby boy. So all the sources agree to, this, to the reason why we have this custom. And the reason is based upon an iconic teaching in the Talmud in the book of Nida. The Talmud is talking about the child, a baby, before they're born. 
And it's a very long piece, a very interesting piece. So it begins by describing kind of the layout of the child, you know, the fetus in utero, and the fact that the, the orifices are closed and how the baby is able to get the food from the mom. And as the child is born, all the closed orifices are open and all the open orifices are closed. And after it lays out uh, the, the layout of the child, the physical layout of the child in utero, it talks about very spiritual things. And it says that there is a candle lit atop the head of the child, a child before they're born. There's a candle on their head. And they're able to see and gaze from one end of the world to the other. And they teach the child the entire Torah. And as a child is about to be born, an angel comes and smacks them on the mouth and makes them forget the entire Torah. If you have had a chance to peruse my new book, Upon a Ten-String Tarp, you know that this teaching in the Talmud from the book of Nita, page 30b, that is how we open the book, the brand new book, upon a ten-string tarp. This is the opening subject of the book. But the Talmud tells us that right when the child is born, all the Torah that they had studied in utero, all that is forgotten. Angel comes, smacks them on the mouth, and forget it all. And they're born totally ignorant. And you have a child here, according to our sages, that a week ago knew all of Torah and now forgets it all. And think about how devastating it is for that child, the child's soul. You knew all of Torah and now you know nothing. We have to console the child. So we do a consolation. We get together and we try to cheer up the new baby. It's okay. You can learn it anew. There is, again, a custom to have chickpeas And in general, whenever there is a mourning in Jewish halacha, Jewish law, we have foods that are round to indicate the cyclical nature of life. Now the child is experiencing a nadir. You had all the Torah, you lost it, but don't worry, things will swing back up again. There are brighter times again, and that's why we get together to console the child for the Torah that they lost. That is well known. That is the reason why we have this custom for the Shalom Zachar. If you think about it, there are some obvious questions with this idea. You know, our child, our boy, was born early Monday morning. And therefore, when did the child forget the Torah? Right when they were born, on Monday morning. In fact, the Midrash says, that the reason why babies universally cry right when they're born, it's the soul yelping in sadness because it forgot all the Torah. So when was this loss of Torah? It happened right after birth. And therefore, if there's a need to console the child, you would imagine that you should do it right away. We should get together Monday morning. We should have maybe a breakfast. Maybe we should hold off on the drinking if it's early Monday morning. I don't know. But that's what you'd imagine. If that's when the devastation, so to speak, the child forgot the Torah, it happened then. Why are we waiting until Shabbos? Question number one. Question number two, we know that under normal circumstances in Jewish law, mourning, consoling those who experienced a loss, That's suspended on Shabbos. So God forbid someone loses a relative, they have to sit Shiva, they need to be consoled, they're mourning. Shabbos comes and you cannot display any signs of mourning. Here's the opposite. We do it only on Shabbos and not during the week. So if this is about mourning or or consolation for the child, why does it have the opposite rules of consolation of other mourners. Question number two. And finally, question number three, if you saw the spread that we had Friday night, you would say, this does not look sad, melancholic mourning at all. It was in fact quite jubilant. 
there was singing, there were words of Torah, there was lots of beer and alcohol and candy, and everyone was happy and upbeat. It was quite jubilant. It was quite exuberant. What kind of mourning is it to lament the loss of Torah of the child? Why is it done? Why is this consolation done in such a cheerful fashion? Those were my questions that I posed on Friday night. And here's the answer I suggested. This is the approach that I suggested to explain what's actually happening over here. If you think about it, you know, the child had Torah. What Torah did the child have? The child had everything. All of Torah was at the child's fingertips. He had greatness but it slipped away from him. And of course, the goal is, the goal of life is to try to reclaim that, to try to restore that. So he had it, he lost it, he's trying to get it back. I speculated that there is a precedent for this. There's another case, there's another example of greatness, of of a peak achievement that was achieved and lost and The aspiration is to restore that. And when we examine that other incident, the other example that that has this pattern, we find something really interesting. The Talmud tells us in the book of Shabbos, page 88a, it tells us that when the Jewish people said, we will do and we will listen before the Sinai revelation, and they committed to uphold the Torah before they even knew what it contained. They agreed to the Torah sight unseen. Talmud says this was an act of angels. They acted like angels, committing themselves to God even before they know what it entailed. And as a result of that, the 600,000 souls of the Jewish people 600,000 angels descended from heaven. Each angel was bearing two crowns, one for Na'asa we will do, and one for Nishma we will listen. And they placed those crowns atop the heads of the 600,000 Jews that were present. The Jewish people said something so incredible. Na'asa Nishma, we will do, we will listen, we're in, we're committed to Torah before we even know what it contains. And that was just such an incredible act of commitment to God, they earned two crowns and 600,000 angels descended and installed those crowns, one for Naset, one for Nishma, on the heads of the Jewish people. But then, 40 days later, the Jewish people sinned, and they did the golden calf. And with the sin of the golden calf, they lost those crowns. And 1.2 million angels came and removed the 1.2 million crowns, 600,000 times two, the Jewish people lost them. Continues the Talmud, but those crowns were not lost for all. Those crowns were all acquired by Moshe. Amr Rabbi Yochanan, Berkulam, Zacha, Moshe. Moshe actually was able to incorporate within him all 1.2 million crowns, concludes the Talmud, in the future, we will once again get, we will, we will once again get our crowns back. It quotes a verse in Isaiah, the Jewish people will have glory and, and, and joy upon their head, and that's referencing the crowns upon their head that Jewish people lost out. So we have, again, this pattern. Jewish people get the crowns, they lose the crowns, Moshe gets it, and in the future, whenever that is, the Jewish people are once again going to earn their crowns back. Now, the Talmud elsewhere tells us that in Olam Abba, it's going to be a very different world than this world. Olam Abba, the world to come. Says the Talmud in the book of Brachos, page 17a, Ha'olam Abba, in Olam Abba, there's no eating, there's no drinking. 
There's no procreation. There's no business. There's no envy. There's no hatred. There's no competition. What is there? Tzadikim Yoshvim. The Tzadikim are sitting ve'atroseim biroshehem. And their crowns are in their heads. And they are enjoying the pleasure of God. So we have a description of the future time where it's the righteous people sitting with their crowns in their heads. It seems obvious to me that the crowns being described in the future are the same crowns the Jewish people initially got at Sinai. They got it when they said, They got it when they said, we will do and we will listen with the commitment of angels. They lost it with the golden calf. Moshe got it. But in the future, the Jewish people in Olam Abba will be tzaddikim, righteous people sitting with their crowns on their head or in their head, to be more precise, and they will enjoy the pleasure of God. Now, you may have noticed when I read the Talmud precisely, it said that in the future, the tzaddikim, the righteous, are sitting with their crowns in their heads. In their heads. It doesn't say on their heads. In Hebrew, if you wanted to say crowns on your head or on their heads, it would say it would say al rosheim, crowns atop their heads. That's not what the Talmud says. The atrosheim and their crowns biroshem are in their heads. So the commentaries all ask, wait a minute, what's going on over here? What do you when you put a crown on your head, it goes on your head, not in your head. So the Rebchaim Velazhenor says that in the future, the crowns won't be on their heads. It will be in their heads. Because if you have a crown on your head, it could be swiped off your head. It could be taken off your head. It could be removed from your head. It could be stolen off your head. And the Jewish people at Sinai, they said, Na'asevin, we will do and we will listen. And they had crowns placed atop their heads. But because it was still on their heads, it could be removed from on their heads. In the future, in Olam Abba, the crowns will be in their heads. That's indicating that they will never lose it. It will be integrated within them permanently, and they will have it completely. So that's the layout of the idea of the crowns. Crowns, we had it at Sinai, but we didn't have it permanently, and therefore was subject to being removed. The Jewish people sin with sin of the golden calf. Those crowns are removed. Moshe gets them all. In the future, in Olam Abba, we'll get those crowns, and those crowns in that future iteration will be in our heads, so to speak. We won't lose them. That's the layout of the subject of the crowns. Now, here's the really interesting twist. The Arizal, the great Kabbalist, he tells us that on Shabbos, the Jewish people temporarily are able to get back their crowns that they lost with the synagogue calf. And Moshe, the whole week, Moshe has all 1.2 million crowns comes along Shabbos, and to a certain measure, to a certain degree, the crowns are restored to their original owners. And therefore, the prayer tells us, we say a prayer on Shabbos morning, Yismach Moshe b'matnas chelko, Moshe will be happy with his portion, continues the prayer, you put a crown of glory on his head, or in his head, to be more precise. Why is Moshe happy with his portion? Even though the whole week he has his portion and everyone else's portion, on Shabbos he has just his portion, and nevertheless, Moshe is still happy. So again, I, I don't want to get to, to lose the flow here. We had crowns at Sinai. They weren't in our heads. They were on our heads. We lost them as in the golden calf. In the future, we'll get them back permanently, but on, Sh but on Shabbos, we get them temporarily back. And Moshe has to kind of seed those crowns that he has on consignment. He has to seed them to us on Shabbos. Now, why 
the Jewish people merit to get the crowns back on Shabbos? You know, if we if we lost the crowns, there's a good reason why we lost those crowns. Why do we get those crowns back on Shabbos? So I think the answer is obvious. When will we get the crowns back permanently? In Olam Abba. Olam Abba, there's no sitting, there's no standing, there's no eating, there's no competition, there's no business. There are righteous people sitting with the crowns in their heads. That's Olam Abba. The Talmud tells us that Shabbos is akin to Olam Abba. Shabbos is a measure of Olam Abba. There's an element in Shabbos that is somewhat similar to Olam Abba. And therefore, if in Olam Abba we get our crowns back, then on Shabbos, which has some degree, some measure, some scintilla of Olam Abba, those crowns that were taken away from us, we get them back on Shabbos. Shabbos is over. The level of Olam Abba goes away. And therefore, we once again lose our crowns. But because Shabbos is a measure of Olam Abba, therefore, we get back those crowns temporarily. But in the future, when it's actually Olam Abba, those crowns will be not on our heads, in our heads. Nothing can dislodge it. No one can snatch it away. It cannot be removed when Shabbos is over. There cannot be menacing angels that come and take it away. It'll be in our heads permanently. So we have a pattern here, the pattern of the crowns. At Sinai, we got the crowns, two crowns. It was given to us. It was placed on our heads. We didn't quite earn it. And therefore, when we sinned, it was swiped away. It was swiped off our heads. Moshe, who didn't sin, he retained his permanently and even scooped up ours. Comes along Shabbos. We're temporarily given our crowns back. But even then, we lose it when Shabbos ends. But in Olam Abba, the crowns will be in our heads. It will be permanently ours. Perhaps we can suggest that the same thing can be applied, or the same pattern can be applied regarding the child and the lost Torah. The child, before they're born, is taught the entire Torah. Immediately prior to birth, the child knows the entire Torah. Seemingly with no effort on his part. Why does the child know the whole Torah? So if you read that first chapter in my book, you know that the reason why is because the candle was atop his head. The candle, which is a reference to the child's soul, was the child's consciousness and like a crown, it was perched atop his head. And because the soul innately knows Torah, the child who has the soul as his consciousness knows what the soul knows, and hence knows the entire Torah. And therefore, so long as the soul is primary, so long as the soul is your consciousness, all the Torah that's inherent in the soul is known to you comes along the angel and smacks the kid in his mouth. That is the infusion of the Yetzirah within a person and the submersion of the soul within the depths of man. And in the first chapter of the book, we lay out exactly how the soul works out. Before birth, the candle, which is a euphemism for the soul, in fact, the soul in Scripture is called Ner Hashem, the candle of God. The candle is atop the head. The child's connection to the soul is sensory. After birth, the candle is still present, but it's no longer atop the head. Instead, it's submerged within the depths of man. Thenceforth, the soul is not the candle on the head. It's the candle deep inside the innards of man, searching out a way out of the labyrinthine maze that it is placed in. The candle is now buried within the child. It's still present, sure, but man's sensory connection 
to it is severed. So again, we see a pattern emerging. Child had the candle atop his head and therefore knew all the Torah of the candle. You had it. Comes along birth. Angel smacks the child. And the connection to Torah is lost. And again, like the crowns, there's a difference between having something in your head and on your head. Man's candle was Daluk Al Rosha, was lit atop his head, but it was susceptible to be supplanted, to be removed. When Torah, like the crown, is given to a person for free, it can be taken away, it can be swiped away, it can be removed. But something happens on Shabbos. I say this tell us that on Shabbos, everyone is given a neshama yaseira, an extra soul. And just like on Shabbos, which is a measure of the world to come, and therefore we have a little bit of a connection to ourselves in Olam Abba, and we're able to get back those crowns temporarily on Shabbos, so too Shabbos, when we get the extra soul, is a measure of life the way it was before birth, we're able to regain a bit of the lost Torah on Shabbos. Thanks to our extra soul that we have on Shabbos, once again, to a certain measure, to a certain degree, the soul is present in a more conscious fashion on Shabbos, and therefore the Torah that it had in a completely unadulterated fashion is once again restored to a certain level on Shabbos. So perhaps an analogy to explain this idea. The Mishnah tells us that, you know, if you live in Israel, there are lots of agricultural laws you must abide by. One of them is called Meiser tithing and Truma, the various tithes that are given to the Kohen. If you buy produce from someone who is not reliable, And they say, oh, don't worry, I already tithed it. I tithed it. I gave the 10% to the Levite. It's good. It's kosher for you to eat already now. But this person is not really reliable. You don't trust them. Maybe they're lying. And there's no way for you to figure out by looking at the produce itself. So the law states that you must re-tithe it. Because you don't know. The person is not reliable. However, if you ask that person, the unreliable person, you ask them on Shabbos, on Shabbos, they become reliable. There's a certain elevation that a person experiences on Shabbos, thanks to the extra soul, their connection to Torah is a little bit deeper than it typically is, and therefore even someone that would not be reliable during the week, the mission tells us on Shabbos they are reliable. Why? Because now they have a deeper connection to Torah, almost an innate connection The innate connection that they had before birth is restored to a certain extent, and therefore they are reliable. So here's the speculation. We don't get together on a Monday to console the child. We wait until Shabbos. Because now we have a pitch. We have a message. We tell the child, you're sad, you're reeling, You're lamenting the loss that you had. You had all the Torah at your fingertips. It's all gone. But it's Shabbos now. And you've regained a little flicker of that Torah that you had before birth. A small measure of that Torah has been restored. Yes, the soul was the candle atop your head. And now it's gone. You can't even find it. You have to look really, really, really hard deep within you to discover it. But to a certain extent, now on Shabbos you have an extra soul, and thereby you're able to relive and reacquire a little bit of the lost Torah, and now we can console you. You lost it, but you still have within it, but you still have, but you still have some of it within you. It's not lost completely. There is a remnant of that candle, a flicker, a spark of that candle that is still present and you could still sense. And therefore we could give a message to the child with the appreciation of what you lost. Now you have your marching orders. Now you know what you need to do. 
And just like with those crowns, we got it for free. It was on our heads, not in it, and therefore was possible to have it taken away. And indeed, we lost those crowns with sin. But we regained them temporarily on Shabbos. And the goal is, in Olam Abba, the righteous will have the crowns in their heads. It will be permanently theirs. So too with Torah. You had it for free. Before you were born, the candle was on your head, and you had unearned, you had all of Torah. But it was on your head. You didn't earn it yourself. And therefore, at birth, comes along the angel, smashes you in the mouth, and like that, you forget it all. But now it's Shabbos. And you have an extra soul. And you have a taste, a little bit, a measure, an element of what it's like to have the Torah within you. And you know what your goal is. Your goal is to make it yours. To take that Torah that was on your head and now it's lost within you. To rediscover that. And when you do that, when you acquire it on your own, just like those crowns in Olam Abba, just like the crown that Moshe was able to maintain, it will be in you, not on you, and it can never be taken away from you. The Talmud tells us, the book of Kiddushin, page 32a on the bottom, going into 32b on the top, it's talking about whether people who are important and deserving of honor and respect, if they can forego their honor. So a child has to honor their parents. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Suppose the parent says, you know what? I forgive you. You don't need to honor me. Is it within their rights? Says the Talmud. Yes. If a father says, I forgive you. I forego. I yield my honor. You don't need to honor me. The answer, the law is, the child does not need to honor them. It's the father's honor. He wants to ignore it. He wants to yield it. He can forgive it. What about a rabbi? What about a Torah teacher? Can a Torah teacher say, you know what, you have to honor the Torah teacher, but it's okay, you don't have to honor me, I forgive it. I forego it, I yield it. So Torah brings two opinions. One opinion says, the rabbi, the teacher, they're representing God. They're the emissary of God. They are the bearers of Torah. How could they forgive their honor? That's the first opinion. The second opinion says, no. Harav shamachal al kvodo kvodo machol. If a rav, if a rabbi wants to forgive, wants to forgo, wants to yield his honor, it is, in fact, yielded. Why? Because we see God yielded his honor. God, after the Exodus, was marching in front of the Jewish people. And therefore, if God could forego his honor, certainly the rabbi can forego his honor. But says Talmud, wait a minute. God, he owns everything. And therefore, the owner of something can forego the rights to that thing. But do you own Torah? to forgo the rights of Torah, says the Talmud, yes. And this is the critical point. If someone studies Torah, they are acquiring Torah. Who owns Torah? Depends. Before you study it, it's God's Torah. After you study it, it's yours, says the Talmud. It's yours. You have now acquired it. And therefore, it's yours. You could choose. It's my honor. It's mine. I own it. If I own it, I can forgo the rights that come with it. And therefore, says the Talmud, if a rabbi, if a Torah sage, if a scholar wants to forgo, wants to yield his honor, he may do it because the honor of Torah, that, and that's, of course, the reason why we have to honor them, because they are, they are bearers of Torah. But they're not bearers of God's Torah, so to speak. It was God's Torah, but now they become Owners, they gain a proprietary interest in the Torah, and therefore they own it, and they can forgo the rights to it. When someone studies Torah, it's not a candle that's placed on their head. It's like those crowns. It's in their head. It's them. It's, it, it's theirs, and they own it. 
Talmud tells us about Acher. Acher, his real name was Elisha ben Avuya, and he was one of the sages. He was, in fact, the teacher of Rabbi Meir. Well, who's Rabbi Meir? Rabbi Meir is the primary author of the Mishnah. So this Elisha ben Avuya, who became nicknamed Acher, he was one of the great sages of his era. And he's the only one that has the ignominious distinction of being a great sage and then becoming a heretic. So it's one of the sad and tragic stories of the Talmud where there was a great sage who became a heretic. And the Talmud actually gives us the whole reason why it happened. It's a very interesting subject. But regardless, this individual became known as Acher, which means the other one. And he is almost a villain in our history, someone who was at the absolute peak, at the absolute acme of scholarship and became a heretic. But the Talmud tells us that his daughter was destitute, was impoverished. And she went to Rabbi Judah the Prince, who was not only the greatest Taurus sage of his era, this is the era that comes after Acher, the next generation, but he was also the wealthiest Jew. And people that were poor and impoverished would come to ask for support. So the daughter of Acher, the daughter of the disgraced former sage who became a heretic, came to beg Rabbi Judah the Prince for some support, for some charity. So he inquired, he wanted to know who she was. Who are you? What, what's your family name? What's your story? So she says, I'm the daughter of Acher. And he says, I don't believe it. Acher, the villain? He still has children? He still has progeny? Doesn't make any sense. He's someone whose entire bloodline should be gotten rid of. Should be made extinct, quoted a verse in scripture. He shouldn't have a son, shouldn't have a grandson. There should be no remnant of him. So she responded, remember his Torah, but ignore his deeds. Because after all, he was a giant Torah sage. And when she said that, remember his Torah and ignore his deeds, a fire descended from heaven, the Talmud tells us, and it singed the bench the chair of Rabbi Judah the Prince. The fire of Torah, of Acher, the villain, Elisha ben Avuya, who was, again, slated to be one of the great giants of our people's history and became a villain, became a heretic. The Torah of Acher came to defend him. The Talmud concludes that Rabbi Judah the Prince started crying. He says, look, someone who disgraced the Torah, someone who repudiated the Torah, someone like that. The, sto- the Torah still comes to defend him. Imagine how the Torah will defend those who still cherish and honor it. It's an amazing idea. If you acquire Torah, it is yours. The crown is in your head. Nothing can take it away from you. And even someone again, as disgraceful as Acher, who rejected it, who tried to forget his Torah, who tried to get students to leave the academy. But nevertheless, when he studied Torah, he acquired the Torah, became his Torah. He became the owner of that Torah, and nothing, even he couldn't reject the Torah. The Torah was still his forever. So we have a pattern here. You get something for free, it's only on your head. It can be taken away. Both the crowns and the Torah of the child gets in utero. On Shabbos, both those crowns and the Torah comes back to a certain degree. The crowns come back because Shabbos is like Olam Abba to a certain extent. And therefore, if you're going to get those crowns permanently in Olam Abba, you're going to get a little taste of it on Shabbos. The Torah that the child had in utero is a product of the soul. The soul was lost. The Candle was taken off the head and put within the child, but on Shabbos you get the extra soul. And therefore, 
on Shabbos as well, there is a measure of restoration of the Torah that existed before, that, ex that existed prior to birth. And therefore, we have this child, and now is the time to console him. Because now he knows that he still has some connection to that Torah, and he knows what he needs to do. You had it for free. You got it for free. Now it's time for you to earn it. And once you earn it, it's yours forever. And with that, I concluded with a blessing to the brand new baby. Now you've got a taste, a flicker, a scintilla, a measure of what you lost. Shabbos came around. And now you know a little bit. You, you're, you're consoled by the fact that some of that Torah still exists within you. And you know what? It's not a time to lament or mourn. It is, in fact, celebratory because we're focusing on the temporary restoration of Torah. But we remind the child, it's still not yours. Shabbos is over. The extra soul goes away. And once again, we're plunged to a certain degree into darkness. But it's still possible for you to quiet yourself. And the blessing that I extended to the young boy, to my young son, is that over the course of your life, you have an opportunity to once again acquire the Torah for yourself. And once you actually earn it, that crown, that Torah, that candle's not on your head, it's in your head, and it's yours forever. May he merit to become a great Torah scholar, a righteous Jew, someone who brings honor and pride to the family, to the community, to the Jewish nation, of course, to the Almighty in heaven. Please, God, tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. at the Torch Center, he will enter the covenant, the fraternity of Abraham. Please, God, Bezat Hashem, please, God. And my hope, my blessing is that he's able to live up to the expectations of our nation and to be a righteous person, to be a tzaddik. And my blessing to all of y'all is, may you too be fortunate to live up to the great expectations that money has for you, become righteous, become a tzaddik, and restore that crown, the crown of Torah, restore it onto your head in a permanent fashion. As always, my address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.